All right. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining here in the classroom here on Zoom. I'm very, very excited about uh, today's event. Today's guests are uh, Jennifer Dickerson and Sarah Mercado, both joining us from the San Bernardino County Museum. Also, a special thank you to Daniela Bedoya, a colleague of Jennifer's and Sarah's, working over at the uh, San Bernardino County Museum, who made this happen. Um, it was really Daniela's idea to say, hey, I know some awesome people, and I want to introduce them to our colleagues, uh, our peers, our, our classmates, others within the department, um, and talk a little bit about museum studies. I will share uh, this, uh, the, the link for this document that you see up here. Obviously, I'll share it in the, um, in the description when I share this uh, video, and I'll also be sharing any links that Sarah and Jennifer want me to sh share. I'll be sort of over here, after I grab a couple bottles of water for our guests, I'll be over here uh, uh, typing in websites that you suggest that I type in, sharing them in the chat as you suggest that I share them. Um, again, after uh, just a couple minutes here. Um, and uh, I also want to share on behalf of my colleagues, uh, uh, Professor Tom Long and uh, Professor Daisy Ocampo, our own museum studies certificate program. I'm not sure if one of them is going to join us to talk a little bit about that, but I will at least have the link to share with those of you who might be interested in learning more about it. Um, okay, so without uh, further ado, I, I want to now introduce our guests. Thank you so much for making the time coming over here to join us. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to, to learn more from both of you. Uh, please, Sarah, Jennifer, when you're ready, take it away. You want to just us to talk from here? Does that work? Yeah, as you, you uh, uh, whatever you're most, if you want to stand up, you can, you can. Uh... You want us to look at the people who are in the <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, I don't want to be in the way though. No, no, that's perfect. Are you going to come with me? Oh, I'll just, yeah, just okay. <laughs> okay, I'm going to. Um, so I'm Jennifer Dickerson. I am the curator of history for the San Bernardino County Museum. I've been with the County Museum for almost eight years now. I started in June of 2015, so in June it'll be eight years. Before the San Bernardino County Museum, I worked at the Mission Inn Museum in Riverside, also as the curator of history. Um, I have my bachelor's in classical civilization, so if there's any fellow uh, Greek and Roman nerds out there. <laughs> I really liked Greek and Roman. Uh, funny thing is, I was actually pre-med and a biology major, and I was pre-med my entire four years at UCLA. Um, my fourth year, I decided that I like history more than going to medical school, so I decided to change route after I graduated. Um, I did one year of post-bac studies at UCR, in history, and then I got my master's degree in history from Cal State Fullerton. I'm Sarah Mercado. I'm the museum registrar at the San Bernardino County Museum. I have my bachelor's in anthropology and my master's degree in historical administration. Um, my bachelor's I got from Cal Poly Pomona, master's I got from Eastern Illinois University. Um, I've been working in the museum field fully for about a year and a half, almost two years now in my current position. Um, before that, I've interned at the museum, volunteered, as well as worked the front desk, all at the San Bernardino County Museum. Um, yeah, I've always wanted to go into museums, and so it's kind of my path that I've stayed on this entire time. <laughs> um, and Sarah brought up a good point. I have actually been in the museum field for over 13 years now. So I was at the Mission and Museum for almost six years. Um, so I did not anticipate working in the museum field, and I realized how difficult it is to get into the museum field, so I'm very lucky. Thank you so much. Um, uh, after switching my mind and not wanting to go to medical school, <laughs> I decided I actually wanted to be a history professor. I happened to get my job at the Mission and Museum just helping with guest services and the store. I uh, loved it so much. I became history curator, I think about a year later, and knew that this is what I was supposed to do. So I think um, if there's any advice I can give to anybody, uh, go volunteer, go apply for museums, regardless of position, whether it's curatorial assistant like Daniela, or if it's front desk staff um, or guest services staff, you can learn a lot from each 
division of a museum. It also helps to get your foot in the door. Um, just getting any experience, just being able to interact with the director and uh, the curators and just other staff. Um, if, so, if working in a museum is something you're really passionate about, getting your foot in the door and kind of being that squeaky wheel um, and just making it known that you were wanting to pursue this profession and pursue this line of work um, really goes a long way in this field with how competitive it is. Um, yes, there's thousands upon thousands of museums, but open positions are very hard to get and very hard to come by. Um, so just kind of get your foot in the door and just keep at it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, and some, we're talking about resources. The two, so the San Bernardino County Museum is an accredited museum, which we are accredited through the AAM, the American Alliance of Museums, which is the National Museum Organization. Um, they have amazing resources, so definitely check out AAM. Um, we also are very tied to CAM, uh, the California Association of Museums. So they have, not to sound redundant, but wonderful resources as well. Uh, conferences are your best friends. And I know sometimes it's really difficult to have the time to go to conferences or have the funds to go to conferences. But a lot of these programs offer scholarships. I even applied for a scholarship for AAM a few years ago and got the scholarship. Um, so. We have a few questions. Oh, do we have a link? Yes. Thanks. Um, so, let's see, we have a couple of questions. Um, so, one is what can history majors with a bachelor's do in museum work? So, it really depends, like Sarah was saying, it depends on what you want to do, um, and it depends on the museum. Uh, bachelor's degrees are really helpful and they can get you really far. Uh, if you want to do things like curatorial work or higher level, you probably want to go for a master's or a certificate program or even a PhD. I don't have a PhD, but kudos to everybody who has a PhD. <laughs> um, our integrated sciences curator has a PhD. Uh, previous curators have PhDs, um, but really the bachelor's degree can give you a good foot step to more. Is that a PhD in, in museum studies or in history or? So there are so people in like my museum circle have different PhDs. So I don't know what Mackenzie's is in. It's in something biology related. Yeah, I think it's in like general biology actually. And she just specialized in, I think birds, um, which is why she's such an asset to our, our museum with our bird collection. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it all, like Jen was saying, all the jobs are different. Um, and it depends upon the size of the museum. If you're going for somewhere that's like the Smithsonian, something a large federal institution, you probably are going to need PhDs for the higher level positions just because they are so, you know, recognized. Um, for smaller institutions like ours or even smaller ones, um, you know, if you have the right number of years of experience or the right experience, you can probably get away with just having a bachelor's degree. But a lot of museums now are looking for certificates, special, specialization, or, you know, masters. Um, and I do know some friends of mine uh, have PhDs in public history. Mm -hmm. um, that helps a lot. But if you're looking specifically for, like, a curatorial role, like in history or things like that, history is a little different. Because history, you can kind of have a PhD in many things. <laughs> um, but you probably want a specialization PhD. So again, if you're really into rocks, you might want to get a PhD in geology, like I'm sure Scott has, yeah. <laughs> our, our coworker. Um, but again, our, our director has a master's in public history and he was going for a PhD in public mm -hmm. history. So that can get you really far too, especially if you're looking at administrative work. So if you're not looking to work with objects or with exhibits or collections um, and you're looking to do like fiscal budgeting, managing, that public history will really help. Another question, what's something you think every student with an interest in museum work should know about it that they might not learn in the classroom? That's Max. Oh, is it Max asking? Yeah, that's Max. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, hi, Max. Um, Max is a volunteer. Yeah. Oh, he's in my morning classes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of, I learned a lot, well, I learned everything outside the classroom because my master's is in history. So 
um, I learned all of my museum work like hands on, not in school. So um, history was really helpful because I learned how to research my degree. Rather, I learned how to research my resources for things to look into. But all of my uh, curatorial work and all my museum work was hands on. None of it was in school. I don't have a certificate in public history. I don't have a museum studies certificate or anything like that. It's all history based. Mm -hmm. I have one in classroom. They don't tell you to volunteer all the time. So volunteer, yes. and again, look for jobs, even if it's front desk position, even if it's part-time, you, again, you get, it's your foot in the door and it also gives you a different perspective. I've worked the front desk, I've worked the gift store, I've worked in archives, it, I've done administrative work, I've done supervising. So it's really just kind of all encompassing when it comes to museums. What is something surprising that you learned working in a museum? Something you didn't think or appreciate as a visitor, but now look for when you visit other museums. I have one. And I thought this going into grad, going in, doing it in grad school. We were, I had a museum studies background. So one of our classes was exhibits and we went on tour. We went to a few museums. We went to conferences and something that's really odd is how something is mounted in an exhibit. Mm -hmm. The amount of skill and finesse that these that some of these you know fabricators, um, exhibit fabricators can do in a museum with these objects is amazing. Hanging things from the ceiling, you know, making it look like it's alive, different things like that. Um, that and then just also the sheer amount of objects that are not on display that each that every museum holds. Um, would you say was like 5% of objects that we have at the museum may be on display at any given time? Yeah, I think um, the number that AAM gives is less than 2%. Yeah. So like our collection, our museum collection has 3 million objects and I would bet 98% of those haven't been on display. So collections there <laughs> is a lot of work, <laughs> which you know too, Pam. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. What are some sites and exhibits you are currently working on? What has been your favorite exhibit? Okay. Um, I So I'm the history curator and for the county museum. And working for a county museum is much different than working for a nonprofit museum. I've worked for both. Um, nonprofits have at times different focuses. Um, and then county museum, at least our county museum, mm -hmm. we have four historic sites in addition to our two county museums. So we don't work just at the Redlands facility, the San Bernardino County Museum, but we have our Victor Valley Museum and we also have four historic sites that are spread throughout the county. Um, so one of my biggest tasks that I wasn't fully aware of, <laughs> that now I am, um, is our historic sites and caring for those. Um, they all have displays, so they're all set up in certain ways, uh, different than museums, because historic sites, you're supposed to get immersed in history, like what it's supposed to be like for that particular site. For our county museum, uh, we have a focus of the history, both natural and cultural, for the region. So those are different. Um, so I have a, a respect for each of those but um, my favorite exhibit that I worked on was our pulp culture exhibit and uh, it's about citrus in this region just in case y'all didn't know um there's a lot of citrus history in this region um and what was really neat is that we worked with a panel uh, a group from the community so um some people from the citrus state park um individuals from Colton um just different people and they were advisors to help us tell a complete story so um i think that's one of my favorite exhibits and it was also really well received by guests and it's still on display and it's just really nice um we initially when i first started were at a changing point for our museum and we realized that our community really wanted a family-based museum in their community and so we kind of switched from like a typical academic research-based facility to a very hands-on interactive interdisciplinary uh, museum with interactive components geared towards children. And so um, that's something that I learned is you have to know what your community wants and 
we did what's called um, a strategic plan and our community hands down said they wanted a family centered facility. So we changed gears. So good exhibit, I think, but I I'm have, biased and I did it. So <laughs> I haven't worked on too many exhibits. Um, I dabble here and there when I assist the curators. Uh, but one, the most recent one that I got to help out with, with is our mosaics of the Mojave up at our Victor Valley Museum. Um, it involves uh, Native American history as well as the animals you find in Mojave. So it's an kind of all encompassing um, exhibit of all the divisions that we have. And it's just, it's an interactive one. There's different noises and sounds and you kind of get immersed into it. And it, it was a labor of love that exhibit. And so it's, it's really cool. Um, and that probably is my favorite. And then there's native Serrano language in the exhibit as well. So that's really cool. Um, what is the most common job uh, bachelor students can do in museums? Again, it really depends on the museum, um, but somebody says hi. Uh, it, really, <laughs> it really depends on the museum, but typically for bachelor students, and again, it depends on how long you work for a museum, but entry-level positions for BA are probably, again, guest services, curatorial assistance at times, um, security, maintenance, some admin, our fiscal assistance, you know, they have their bachelors. Um, so it really depends. And again, if it's specifically like a history BA. Um, education too. Yeah. Um, so oh, our, our education, education department. Um, we have a pretty small education department, but some museums have, you know, 10 people working in an education department that's assisting with adult and children programs, um, you know, school tours, things like that. Um, that is something else too that, that can be done. Yeah, so we have a curator of education and then we have a museum educator. So typically, um, it depends on the museum again, but uh, educators can typically have a, a bachelor's and not like an MA. Okay, what are some challenges when dealing with international artifacts or items or working with items on loan from other museums? So I can't speak to international artifacts. I don't really deal with those types of items. We deal with loaned items all the time, um, both what we call incoming loans, so objects coming into our museum for other facilities, and then outgoing loans, items we loan to individuals. Um, <laughs> it, loans are a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, it's a lot of paperwork and there's a lot of liability on both ends. So you need to make sure you have a museum registrar mm -hmm. um, to ensure that all the policies and procedures are being followed. We're an accredited museum, so we have an extra set of uh, procedures that we're supposed to adhere to and museum ethics that we definitely have to adhere to. Um, so there's loan terms. So usually we just talked about this this morning. Yeah. Uh, loans for our museum are typically a year in length. Mm -hmm. They can be longer depending upon, you know, an agreement that is reached. Um, typically like to do one year loans. And that's just so we can kind of monitor the status of the object, the, you know, safety of the object. Um, in the past, we our museum and other museums do what we call permanent or indefinite loans. Those can cause some issues. Um, things get left for years and years and years, and then we find them. Um, or, you know, when we just, we have to try to track down paperwork. It just, it causes a lot of issues. Um, we don't deal too much with international stuff. Um, we do have some like textiles from other countries. We do have artifacts in our um, anthropology division from other countries, which we are actually currently working on repatriating um, over 1,100 objects back to Mexico. Um, from our anthropology department. Yeah. So uh, due to NAGPRA. So yes. we are repatriating objects to follow NAGPRA. So that's kind of some of the not issues or challenges. Um, I mean, it is kind of a challenge because right now we're trying to quickly package everything up uh, and get everything ready to go. Um, oh, yeah. and also we're a repository. Um, so for archaeological and paleontological objects. So those items. A lot of them we don't technically own since we're a repository. It's the where it came from or the group. Uh, I can't think of the, the archaeological group or whoever's working on the dig. Um, they give those to us to house, uh, but we don't technically own those objects. So those are all on loan too. 
Um, what are some skills you did not expect you would need? Um, liking to clean, um, <laughs> kind of being open-minded. Um, if you are ever in a museum studies program or you're ever around people um, that work in museums or see museum job postings, you'll see the words, other duties as assigned. Mm -hmm. And take that to heart, because that is what happens. Um, I am museum registrar, but I float all around. I help with different things. I help build shelves, help, you know, kind of all over the place. Um, and our curators do the same. I mean, we were, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were out at one of our historic sites, dusting and cleaning. Um, so you just never know what's what's going to happen. And so being flexible is one thing that I think yes. that know as much coming in as I do now. Definitely. And as funny as this is going to sound, uh, sewing. I didn't know I was going to have to sew. I still kind of don't. I make Sarah do the sewing. Um, to sew tags on, identification tags onto textiles. So little things like that, I would have never thought, oh, you kind of do need to know how to sew um, to label items. So little things like that. How does NAGPRA, Cal NAGPRA impact Indigenous exhibits and items? Um, so it can prevent us from being able to put certain things on display. Um, if a tribe deems certain items as, you know, uh, spiritual or, you know, ritualistic or, you know, important to their culture, um, they do ask us not to put certain things on display. Um, we have taken some things down because of that. Um, we do have a very close relationship with our local tribes. Um, it also kind of impacts on where, where and how we store items. Um, we do have some ancestors at the museum. They are in their own room, um, you know, covered. We don't really allow people to go into those spaces. Um, and then we're also working on repatriating them as well. Um, our anthropology curator works very closely with the tribes and to get all of that stuff kind of up and going um, and get all the items and ancestors repatriated. Um, can you donate items to a museum? Yes, this is the short answer. We don't accept all items though. Um, so a lot of museums when they first get started, um, and this happens kind of across the board, you don't have any objects. So you automatically want to accept everything that people are donating. Um, what also plays a big part into donations and accepting donations is um, having a clear mission statement um knowing what your museum stands for what you're going to include what you want to be there for is really helpful um we joke about this all the time but it, it's actually serious um we have a polar bear in our collection we have a moose in our collection <laughs> i haven't seen any polar bears or any moose in uh san Bernardino county um but again it kind of goes back to when the museum was being founded in the 60s and the 70s um well 50s really and then when it came to Redlands in the 70s uh, there was a large donation made to the museum um, by an individual who just had a large collection of taxidermy animals and it's just one example there's stuff in history division too but if you're the San Bernardino County Museum and your focus is the county you should only accept things that are focused on your museum just like you know if you're going to the Peterson Museum in LA. They're car-based, so mm -hmm. probably won't accept a polar bear at the Peterson Museum. Um, but you just want to be very aware of what you have in your collection, because if you already have 50 typewriters, <laughs> I don't know anything about that, um, but if you already have 50 typewriters, you probably don't need more typewriters. Um, so museums, after being in existence for several decades, sort of have an, a problem of over accepting donations. Um, when, again, and it's completely normal, but really we should have been more keen on what we were accepting into the museum from the beginning, but it, it happens across the board. So yes, you can donate items to the museum and we love donations. Um, and we get a really, we really appreciate our donors because that's how we have a collection is mostly donations. We do purchase some items. We do transfers from other museums too. But um, primarily, our most of our collection is donation based. So if you want something donated to the museum, you definitely can contact our museum if you want to donate it to our museum. Um, but look into a facility that you'd like to give your stuff to. So 
if you have donated something and you want that back and you cannot find the paperwork and the paperwork was done to the registrar that was before you, how do we go about getting that back? So typically when you donate something to a museum, it's an unrestricted gift, typically. So it depends. It wasn't on supposed to be. I, I know who signed okay. the, the, the loan okay. agreement. Oh, okay. But oh, it was my, a loan agreement. Yes, my husband wants it back. Okay, well, in general, I'll go with in general first. In general, a gift to the museum, a donation to the museum is unrestricted, which means we're giving this you, this is yours, you take the museum. Museums then can use it for however long they want. They can keep it in their collection. It's unrestricted. Um, to put something into museum collections, it's called accessioning. To get something out of museum it's collections, the accessioning. it's the accessioning. Um, and then you can transfer, dispose of whatever you want. If there were conditions, or if it was a, a indefinite loan. or permanent loan, then it's a little bit different. Um, this is why we don't like to do indefinite or permanent loans anymore, because 25 years later, however long, yeah. we have- Well, it wasn't supposed to be a permanent loan. Yeah. It was supposed to be for one um, display only, and that when it was taken down, it was supposed to be given back. Yeah. Sarah can help you for sure. Yes. And I was going to say, if it's a history okay. object, that can help too. But... No, it would. Eh, <laughs> yeah, I forget the name of it. Long, tall thing. Um, well, we do have records. Yes, and again, yeah. Sarah's in charge of those. So we have loan records. We have gift donations. I found, I, I found the loan agreement once, and I haven't been able to find it since. So <laughs> okay. I know I still have it. I just need to know that I can. We can try Email to get there it. and we can yeah, figure okay. it out, yep. <laughs> which again happens all the time as well. We have not that this is your case, but we have loans that have been left at the museum um, and people we don't have the right contact information. So from 1965 and that person most likely has passed away. You know, yeah. we have outdated moved, information, yeah. moved, anything like that. So it gets difficult and challenging to get back in touch with people um, when that happens. So, yeah, definitely email Sarah. Okay, in our museum classes, we talk a lot about decolonization practices within museums. Is this something that is practiced in the field or is still being implemented? Decolonization practices. Oh, uh, yes, definitely. I know that with exhibits that I do, I like to work with the community. So I have a panel usually or a group of advisors that I work with for each exhibit. Um, and it's usually from people within certain communities. Um, so for example, we're doing an exhibit, uh, anytime we do an exhibit, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. Anytime we do an exhibit about local native individuals, if it's somebody from a Kauia tribe, we look at you know our local Kauia neighbors like Morongo, or if it's somebody from Serrano, we work with San Manuel, and we definitely consult with them on any sort of exhibits that we do. And then NAGPRA also dictates a lot of what we do with the physical objects. So definitely working with those sorts of things. And then just in general, not, I don't know good terminology for it, but telling a complete story and telling a whole story about certain things, even if wrongs were done and thing, people were at fault, um, you don't want to leave out bits of a story because it makes a prettier exhibit. And so um, we definitely work with local communities to do things like that. We did an exhibit on slavery um, and we worked with a local group called the Black Voice Foundation. Um, and it wasn't an easy exhibit to do. It was emotional for a lot of people, but we wanted to tell that story and how California played a role in that as well, including this region. So. And I do know just from kind of looking at all the forums and different things that have popped up, um, it is something that is happening across the board in museums, um, at least some of the larger museums. Um, so yeah, it is definitely still going on um, and it's something that actually is kind of picking up and, and speeding up in, in many museums. What sites graduate students go to when museum work, when doing museum work? What sites graduate students go to when doing museum work? Websites? That websites, um, Mason. Do you mean websites, or do you mean uh, like historic sites? Where you are you talking about internships at historic sites or websites? Well, okay. So, so are there some resources like? Uh, and I can also share these later online if you want. But uh, uh, um, 
Sarah, it, thanks for, for running that up there. If you want to, to click over to the Firefox browser and, <laughs> and find any websites that you and Jen want to share, you can feel free to do that, or you can direct Mason just verbally, whatever you feel like doing. So, oh, sorry, take that. Oh, no. Um, so just, you know, if you're a graduate student, and you're looking for, you're looking for museum work, or you kind of want to get to know what's going on in the, you know, in the field, um, like Ben had mentioned earlier, AAM, American Alliance of Museums, is a big one. Um, they have resources, they have job boards, mm -hmm. uh, where most of the museums will post there. Um, you have CAM for California Association of Museums, you have the Western Museums Association. Um, the AASLH. Yeah, AASLH. Amer um, American Association. For state and local history. Right. <laughs> um, I know, sorry, lots of acronyms. You get to know them the more you research them. Um, it is there. Yeah, so let's see. Since you're running it. <laughs> That, and, and I can share a list um, methodically sort of with the recording for anybody afterwards. I don't feel like you have to, but anything you oh, want no. to share. The acronyms are kind of hard to yeah, keep, track, keep track of, too. Um, the one thing that Sarah was saying about AAM, not only do they have job postings and things of that nature, they have guides. Um, they also have um, forums, so you can ask questions and get answers from people in the museum field from across the country. Um, what we do here in California isn't always what somebody in New York is going to do in a museum. Um, and in general, we're all museums and we do the same thing, but there's different laws we have to abide to in California and things like that. Um, so there's little differences and nuances here and there. Um, but they're a really good resource. Um, if you buy a membership, I don't know how much a student membership is, but they have student yeah. memberships. Um, sometimes you can get them, like I said, scholarships. You can just get a student membership. But um, the forums are really, really helpful. Um, they give fellowships and scholarships to their conferences. They have webinars. So some of those are free. Um, I just did one for the Association of Registrars and Collection Specialists um, on Thursday. It was a free virtual meetup. Basically, a bunch of registrars and collections managers got together and over Zoom. And we can just kind of ask questions about, you know, anything we have going on at our museums that, you know, someone that maybe has more experience can answer. So even just reaching out and finding, you know, free things, creating a network. Uh, it's really, really helpful. And same thing with CAM. So the California Association of Museums, same thing. They have conferences, they have webinars, and they have a forum, um, they have an email um, list. So I would definitely recommend those are the two biggies and Sarah put more, but um, it just depends on what you wanna get into. I don't know if everybody in here is history-based, but there's a lot of other things like there's archeology, span um, groups and paleo bio everything um and everyone's got their conferences and their own groups and things like that these are ones that are just kind of big ones to get you started um if you're looking at possibly moving once you graduate with your degree and moving to a different part of the country to get to get a job um look at their boards um states have them regions have them um and they're all just very helpful yeah, and look up different museums. Like if you don't want to leave, look up different museums locally. Um, a lot of people, we get this at least 10 times a day. We didn't know there was a museum in, in Redlands. We didn't know there was a county museum. Um, there, You're going to find a lot like that. Um, there's a lot of historic sites locally that people don't know about. A lot of smaller museums that people don't know about. Um, I know people get surprised that Riverside has like 11 museums. And so just look into local museums and it's a lot of legwork, but everything's on the internet now. So it's really helpful, but look at each of their websites. They're going to be posting on their job boards yeah. first, their internship possibilities. And also, um, some museums are so small that they can't afford or can't, um, are not able to post on some of the larger forums or larger job site pages. So check out Indeed. Check out um, LinkedIn. Um, some of the smaller museums post jobs on there that aren't posted anywhere else. Um, so just kind of look everywhere. But yeah. Next thing. What are the requirements? Uh, oh, one more thing. A quick question. Um, we had uh, we. This is now the, the fourth or the fifth uh, in the in this series. We had teachers and uh, state uh, historic site workers. Terry Pope came in and. 
uh, gave a really great uh, uh, presentation there. And I see some overlap with some of these ones. Oh, our first one was archives. And I was wondering if you could help me understand a little bit about the, is there overlap? Is there intersection of archival work and museum work? Or are these, these completely I'm separate? I'm an archivist too. Okay. So, <laughs> yes. Yes is the short answer. So um, again, it depends on the institution. So our museum has an archive. And so that falls under the history division. And so I oversee our archives so I'm the archivist technically, but it falls under the umbrella of curator of history. Um, but like Nathan at Smiley Library, like there's the library or a facility that has an archives as well. And um, the county has a county archive too. So that's separate from our museum and there's archivists there. So yes, they do overlap. And oftentimes in a museum, you will have an archive dependent on what kind of museum, especially if it's I can't even say, especially if it's a history museum, because biology and geology and like paleo collections all have archival material that go with their collections as well. And so it just depends. Yeah. But for our museum, yes, we we also they overlap. Sure. And it's me. <laughs> it, again, it just depends upon the institution. Um, again, like Joe was saying, a museum with, with an archive within it, you know, a history curator usually can take over that or something with just archival experience. If you're looking at going to like an actual, just what they're called, just a plain archive, um, a lot of times at a library or other places, you're gonna need a different degree. Yes. And that's gonna be an MLIS degree. Um, that's the right acronym. Um, and that a lot of archival work that specializes in archives, you will need that degree. Um, like if you're going to work at the National Archives, like yes. in Paris, for example, or those, Washington DC, anything like that, um, you'll have to have that that different degree. Can I quick follow up on that? Because I, I wanted to ask a question that we always ask our guests, um, and that is, can you reverse engineer the perfect applicant? Um, and this is all obviously for for our students. And we we've talked a little bit about this, and I know it depends on where the person might be working within the museum, right? Mm -hmm. um, but but if you have you been in charge of some hiring processes? Yes. So so if you're, I guess it depends on a range of of positions that are available. But maybe a position coming from a BA student coming out of Cal State, or also an MA student coming out of Cal State. Can you think about some things that you'd like to see on that resume, um, and and sort of help our students reverse engineer the perfect the perfect job application, Definitely. and maybe interview even. No, definitely um, experience. Honestly, that's what it comes down to. Um, when we look at any position, we look at experience. So even for front desk staff, um, it may not be, does this person have experience working in a museum, but does this person have experience working uh, in guest services? And that doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, like operating a register, um, but do they, have they worked with the public? Have they, and that includes volunteer positions. So that doesn't mean just working, um, but also, uh, I know, again, for like curatorial positions, we do look at background, like educational background. Do they have a master's? Do they have an, a master's? Things like that. But um, to reverse engineer, that's why it's really hard. And I know I, I don't want to speak for any of the students, but I know sometimes you know you want to work for a museum. You don't know what you want to do for a museum. And so that's why I think it's just like we were saying volunteer, get to know what you want to do. You may think you want to be an archivist and then after you've scanned your 2000th image oh. and done your fifth, 5,000th uh, Argus or database entry, you may learn you don't want to work with collections anymore. Um, and trust me, it happens a lot with particularly interns. Sarah was a full-time six-month intern. Yeah. So she was there every day for six months. Um, and so you learn a lot and you can speak better to this, but you learn a lot about what you're looking for, what you're interested in. Um, I knew right away that I was very much into exhibits and doing interpretation for exhibits. I love working with collections, but exhibits are like the highlight of my job. So I would say volunteer, go go to a museum, call a museum and just ask them, do they have volunteer positions available? I know for our museum, you can volunteer in whatever division. So including education. So you can be a docent, you can be a tour guide. Um, that might be something you really want to do. And then you might want to go into the education field for a museum. So 
I can kind of speak from experience. I wanted to be a curator for as long as I could remember. Um, I had to do a history pro or do a school project in high school. I chose everyone choosing nurses, things like that. I chose a museum curator. Um, so I got to shadow the period of anthropology for a day at the time. Um, and that was one thing. But after you go through grad school and kind of see all the different, you know, at least in my my grad school, we got to see the different areas, different job descriptions, things like that. And then after my six month internship, I kind of realized, and even more so now, that being a curator is not necessarily my forte. Um, writing panels, writing interpretation is not something that I'm have a strong background in. Um, for me, once I found that like working with objects, um, especially what I'm doing now. Um, it's where I want to be. Uh, I like being behind the scenes and taking care of objects and dealing with paperwork. Um, and so, yeah, just like Jen said, volunteer, do internships, get as much experience as you possibly can um, would be my recommendation. Um, in a different institution. Yeah. And I know time is valuable and we all have a million things going on in our lives. But even if you can dedicate like one shift a week, one shift every two weeks somewhere, um, our museum does things slightly different than another facility. And so you'll get to see how either two things are done, two different things are done the same way or vice versa, how one thing is done two different ways. And so um, it's really, really helpful. And I know from interns and volunteers in the past, um, I have people who really thought they wanted to work with photographs and that's what they wanted to do. But again, after you've scanned 2000 of them, you've learned that, no, I actually like, you know, helping with exhibits and installing them. Um, and it was kind of goes back to your question and what we talked about earlier. Um, our exhibits fabricator, for example, that's like one position. He doesn't have a bachelor's. He's just very skilled in making things. So if you like building things, if you like, mm -hmm. you know, servicing um, machines and things like that, <laughs> there's those types of jobs in museums too that people don't readily think of. Um, and so um, I know that like, again, just to go back to the Peterson, I don't know if it has anything to do with me visiting three weeks ago, <laughs> but they have mechanics on staff that service cars. And again, that's for a museum. It doesn't mean that you have to have a bachelor's or a master's degree in history. And so. So that experience is going to show the first, the hiring committee that you know what, not only what you're good at, but, but what you like to do. And, and you can, you can move into that job more easily because you know, you like it. You can sustain a, a duration of work at the place, loving that work. That's, yeah, that's and that was great. one of the big reasons why I got hired on at the county was because one, they were looking for someone local at the time. They were looking for someone local and I had just came from Riverside or I was working in Riverside and they wanted somebody who had guest services experience, which again, you wouldn't typically need as a curator, but I had guest services experience working at you know the gift shop, doing tours, things like that. Um, but then they also wanted somebody with that background of doing exhibits and working with collections. So do anything and everything you can. Again, you'll find what you like, and then you also get the experience. Um, that question's about me. Yeah. <laughs> What are the oh, of Daniela's job and what is the application process? <laughs> uh, so Daniela's job is curatorial assistant. Mm -hmm. And I know that, I mean, it sounds like a broken record. It depends on the museum. Mm -hmm. um, some museums require very different things of their curatorial assistants and others require other things. So for our museum, um, it did require a bachelor's degree and it required um experience again not to sound like a broken record <laughs> but Daniela had just finished an internship with us and she also stayed on as a volunteer mm -hmm. and so she had worked with a lot of different things with collections with helping clean stuff yeah. with scanning things with working with a database and um, so all those things we looked at um when trying to find somebody to fill the position and so even though Daniela worked just with me in history the curatorial assistants actually for all of our divisions. So Daniela doesn't help just with history now. She helps with biology, with earth sciences, and with the anthropology, and even with education too. Yeah. Um, and so she had to work with dead birds the other day. Yeah. And you know, uh, not not like chairs and sewing needles and photographs like in my collection. And <laughs> um, so again, 
internships are really helpful. I know I'm not sure it depends on what program you are a part of here, but there's different internships. Um, and volunteerships are just as valuable as internships. So even if you don't have like an actual internship program, I definitely recommend just spending your time in volunteering. And the other thing was, what was the application process? So for Daniela's position, we she is good timing. That was one of the things. <laughs> and we just happened to be looking for a curatorial assistant. And her job is what we call in the county PSE, um, which is a contract position. Um, it's not a county position. If it was, a, it is a county position. Let me, don't get that wrong. It is not a regular time county position. And so if it was a regular time county position, we would have to go through the county process, which requires opening up the job application for a certain amount of weeks on our county board, and then um, holding interviews, sometimes just one interview, sometimes two interviews, and then closing out and selecting a candidate. With PSE contract positions, you don't have to do that for the county. So again, it varies dependent on position and it varies dependent on institution. Um, but in this position, we were looking to fill a position very quickly. Daniela was an amazing intern because I have, what, 17 volunteers and interns, I think. Um, yeah. And Daniela definitely stood out. And um, so this also is a good thing when you volunteer and um, intern somewhere, treat it like a job. Mm -hmm. And I say that very nicely because I have volunteers and interns who show up thinking that it, and it should be fun in games. Don't get me wrong. It should be fun that they show up very unprofessional. And when you show up very unprofessional in your dress, in your language, in your mannerisms, that shows to everybody. When you're interning and volunteering, you should treat it like it's a job. Dress professionally, act professionally, and get your job done. No offense to any volunteers or interns that I have, but again, Daniela stood out for a very clear reason because she was on top of things and because she was a great intern. If you go to places and you kind of slack off because you just want the experience, it really doesn't help you. Max is also a very good example of this. <laughs> Max is early every time he comes to volunteer. He's on top of things and he asks questions. So ask clarifying questions. Don't be scared. Please don't do 2,000 database entries wrong because you were too scared to ask a question. <laughs> ask the question. But definitely treat it like a job. Okay, next question. Do you seek out historical societies as reliable resources? How do you establish these sources as credible? Do they need to be accredited to? So historical societies are amazing resources. They're usually local, so they know exactly what they're talking about for their region. We work with a lot of historical societies. Um, I can name probably 12 off the top of my head. Um, usually they're based within cities. So like example, Yucaipa Valley Historical Society is just one, but we also have like the Upland um, Historical Society that we work with and other different ones throughout the county. They are the experts on the region. Dependent on the groups, not all of their, their resources or their information are what we would consider verified. So a lot of them have verified information and are vetted and everything. A lot of them aren't because they don't go through the same processes that different research facilities have to go through. So even if we're using information from a group, we still vet that information and make sure it's the most accurate to the best of our ability. Um, we work with groups. They do not have to be accredited for us to work with them. And um, we also just had this discussion this morning too. Um, when we loan objects, we don't have to loan objects to accredited facilities, but it does help if that museum is accredited because we know they're gonna care for the objects the same way we do, so. Max. <laughs> this has been really, really great. I, I want to, um, I want to keep uh, for for a little while. Keep the conversation going. We are at six twenty-five. I also don't want to impose too much on our guests and ask them to stay um, for for much, much longer than the initial hour that we had planned. So, if anybody joining online has more questions, please, please, you can either raise your hand or you can type them into the chat. 
I want to just highlight a couple of things because it's a trend, and this is for everybody who either has or hasn't been joining for the last four events in this series. One is, I, I think it was Sarah who said this, the open-mindedness and the flexibility and this other duties as a sign. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's been a theme in every single one of our events so far, um, whether it was Terry Pope telling us about uh, state historic uh, uh, state sites, state state parks and state historic sites, or uh, Nathan Gonzalez telling us about um, archives or the, the school teachers that we heard from at the seven to 12 level. Other duties as I'm be prepared to be flexible. What we often say in the future history teacher session is to make yourself indispensable by sort of demonstrating your willingness to do whatever needs to be done to go above and beyond uh, and to set yourself apart from your from your peers with your with your efforts, your excellence, your deportment, how you uh, how you behave, obviously, on the site. And not to interject, yep. I helped with our live animal gallery. So I was helping care for snakes oh, wow. and a bunny and a cockatiel. Never roaches. thought I'd be doing that. Uh, oh, yeah, and some roaches. <laughs> Never thought I'd be doing that as a history curator. But especially if you're not at a facility like the Smithsonian, like the Getty, um, it's very much other duties as assigned, especially when you're a smaller staff. So not yeah. to interject, but no, absolutely. keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that was a crucial. That was a crucial thing that that a lot of students and then graduate students. And this happens also with people in my line of work when we come to a relatively small department like this one. Other duties as design, as as assigned. Indeed, you sort of making that training to work transition, you get really excited about very precise fields of your study. And you think, oh, this is what I'm going to be doing. And it is a part of what you're going to be doing, but there's going to be a lot of other things that you're doing too. Yeah. And as you're saying, through your experience on the job, you discover a lot about yourself and what you, what you in fact also find a lot of joy and, and a lot of challenge and a lot of reward in as well, these other sort of unexpected tasks. So I like that idea. I like that 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 flexibility, um, open mindedness, and, and be prepared for that. Other duties as assigned, uh, as a, as a really exciting aspect, uh, you know, to discover new things. It definitely helps, kind of break up your week. I mean, honestly, for me, no two no two days really are the same. Um, yeah. Today we had a meeting about a fire truck, and then I went and help move a shelving unit, and then I did some database entry. And Wednesday might be going to historic sites, so it's just. You never know what's going to happen, and certain things, some things can pop up randomly. Um, you didn't think you were going to go off site that day, and nope, never mind, you're going off site. So it really keeps things interesting. Um, so it also just kind of helps keep your attention and and keeps things exciting. So and I like to say, like it really helps with the micro and the macro of museums. So like you can see the different silos and how it all comes together to have a functioning museum. You know, you if you have a live animal gallery, you have to feed and care for the animals. If you have historic sites, you have to go clean and dust spider webs because it's a historic <laughs> site. And um, it's just things you have to think about. And I know it's been really rewarding for me, uh, especially like when I was at the Mission Inn Museum, we were very small staff. I think we had like six people on staff when I was there. And, you know, I had to paint and install exhibits on my own. I didn't know how to do any of that. <laughs> I'm very, very not mechanically inclined. <laughs> and so you learn these things. And um, that's why I think it's so important to volunteer because then you won't be caught off guard. Um, and you won't have this line of thinking that, you know, I'm going to be a curator in my office with my white gloves and I'm, I'm going to look at a vase all day because that's definitely not what happens. Um, at least in most institutions. And that so. kind of leads to one more thing that I was thinking of. When you're looking to add applying for jobs, make sure you read the job description very, very carefully. And the reason I say that is it may say collections manager on the title, but you get into it and you start reading and you're like, oh, wait, now I'm also doing, you know, collections manager, but kind of curatorial work, some marketing thrown in there. And you're like, wait, where did all this come from? Um, and again, it depends upon the institution, but always double check the job description, reread it, um, because sometimes terms as titles get used differently at different institutions. So just make sure before you jump into applying for something, um, you read it thoroughly. 
And to piggyback off of that, apply to a job, even if you don't think you qualify, apply to a job. It's worth the time and effort. Somebody might be looking for somebody just like you, but you decided not to apply. So definitely apply. The worst that happens is you don't get selected or you don't get a job. <laughs> Even if you get selected for an interview, though, it's going to help you with your interview skills. Yeah. So definitely just apply. That's great, Danielle. Thank you for making this happen. <laughs> this is this has been really really helpful. Um, I know I I do want to share with the the group very quickly um the the museum certificate program that we have at um cal state so if i can sneak in really quick um i'm just it, it's easy enough i'm sure for everybody to find but i just want to kind of officially share it here And this is, um, those of you who are in um, our uh, CSUSB uh, department here, you may already know professors uh, Long, Tom Long and Ocampo. Um, they're both here in the, um, in the CSUSB history department, but they're also the leads on our uh, museum studies certificate here. So some of you may be what we used to call Track C. Now we, uh, is our a public and oral history program. So you may be already taking classes like this. You may be familiar with a lot of the courses uh, that are going to be on offer here. Um, but there are ways to do this blended with a bachelor's or blended with a master's um, alongside this. Some courses you can consult with Professors Long and Professors, uh, Professor Ocampo about what is permitted in terms of, you know, double counting and that kind of thing towards your master's, towards your bachelor's. These are all uh, um, questions that you can address to my esteemed colleagues uh, down the hall, Professors Long and, and Ocampo, they can tell you a lot more about it. But there are a lot of really wonderful courses here. Um, and of course, there are also internships. Uh, there are internships through this program and we can send you over to uh, to Jen and Sarah, and uh, and and you can get course credit for it. Uh, so so there's a lot uh, a lot of of uh, nice overlap here. Of course, I, uh, Professor Ocampo and, and and Long are wonderful guides through this work. Um, and other we have other faculty members in our uh, in our department who do public and oral history, that kind of thing. And there are also other colleagues in other departments who do related exhibit design work, anthropology. Uh, and some other departments as well. We've worked so, with Dr. Hume before. So. With, uh, Ariana Hume. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. It's 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 a, it's nice to 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 be in the neighborhood. And again, that, that, that crucial thing of the experience of getting in the uh, getting in that that environment, um, getting that experience, um, even if it's just for a few hours a week, uh, getting that uh, getting that, that that experience that line on your resume, your CV. So I I, I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate. Uh, uh, Jen and Sarah just just taking over here and and scrolling through all the questions. I think we got to everybody's question. Is that right? Um, One other thing, I just sorry. I just remembered yeah. too. Not only does it give you uh, when you volunteer, not only does it give you experience, but you are without a doubt going to need a reference, whether it's on your resume or for a job application or for graduate school. And so just keep that in mind too. Is that if you work for a museum, you have that reference and you have somebody who can like write you a letter of rec or you have somebody who can be your reference on um, your CV or resume. So sorry, that just popped into my hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, that goes along with the, the sort of deportment and doing your absolute best when you're on the job. Of course, same as same as in classes. You know, you want to be that that uh, uh, that student or that intern that's remembered by your supervisors, your professor as the one who's doing excellent work and taking the work very, very seriously. Um, so, so you know, what you do in practice, you do in the game, they, they always say so. Uh, this has been been really, really great. Thank you, Daniela, for making this happen. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you, Jen, from the San Bernardino County Museum. I'm gonna share uh, the websites that, um, uh, that are, or the names of the places that, that uh, Jen listed here, I'm actually going to copy this one because I want to make sure I have 
the name of all these ones so that I can look them up later and get the websites uh, to share out with everybody uh, to the group. I don't see any more questions coming in or hands raised, but uh, please join me in giving a, a, a virtual big thank you and applaud uh, to our guests today. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out here, for, for joining us. I'm really excited to, to, to know about the museum and to, to have this preliminary contact with you all. So thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna shut down this Zoom meeting and I'm gonna reopen it. It's gonna be a very brief meeting with the 6,900 students. So please, uh, please uh, jump out. And thank you from Rosandra and from Patricia. Thank you, Maximilio. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks everybody, thank you. Thank you so much.